I will talk about, as the title says, the Jekyll and Hyde of regulatory issues, evidence-based medicine and laboratory tests. I will say at the beginning, noticing this crowd, two things, that if I had my druthers, I would have taken the cookies from there and placed them on the front seats. <clears throat> and second, if this distribution of the classroom were submitted to FDA to approve a laboratory test, we would say this is right-sided biased. You would have been rejected and disapproved. So just to let you know you're all hiding. I, I, I will keep trying to talk this way, but it's more natural for me to look at these guys. So don't feel ignored. Just feel biased up there somehow. By the end of this lecture, which I'll talk for about 40 minutes roughly, I'm hoping that you'll be able to identify the three risk classes of devices that FDA regulates and their regulatory pathways. I'm going to describe in a little bit more detail in what situation the de novo pathway has been and can be used to place a product on the market. It's because the in vitro diagnostic program at FDA uses this pathway more often than other parts of the Center for Devices and Radiological Health. And I think it says something about where our regulatory thinking has been emerging over the last decade. And then finally, and I think this is the most interesting and important part of the talk, I'll describe some of the scientific challenges that FDA faces in the evaluation of in vitro diagnostic products, and I'll try to leave some time for questions. If you wish to ask questions in the middle of the talk, feel free to do so, and we'll speed up or slow down as necessary. So we're going to navigate the presentation. There is far too much for me to discuss to accomplish those three learning objectives well, give you a really good picture of FDA and how we do our business, <clears throat> and try and hit every point on the slide. So there will be a number of slides where there will be a big piece up here, and I'll just talk about a piece of it, and we can come back later to address some of the other issues that I'll have to gloss over briefly. So during the presentation, I'll do a little bit of background and history, and then talk about the organizational features of FDA that structurally matter in terms of how we regulate in vitro diagnostics. I'll then talk about the classification of devices and how that determines pathways to market and what's required to get to market. And what is required to get to market, meaning what studies or what science has to be produced, is really what this is all about. Because I think you'll discover some of the interesting things that need to be done and some things that you think should be done that don't have to be done in order to get to market. And then I'll do a little bit of Mr. Hyde, frowny face, and a little Mr. Dr. Jekyll, uh, smiley face, and then do a summary. This is basically some examples of the way things either do or don't get to market and the problems that ensue in my version of what I like to think of as the non-evidence-based medicine practiced in this country. A little bit of background, a world view, what's going on in vitro diagnostics. From the perspective of FDA, and some of these slides I borrowed from talks given by some of my colleagues at the FDA, and I want to uh, send a specific thank you to Dr. Stephen Gutman, the last director of the Office of In Vitro Diagnostics. He and I retired just about the same time, had very parallel careers at FDA. What's going on? There is increasing and, to some degree, unrealistic expectation by the public for safe products. I'm not talking just about in vitro diagnostics. I'm talking about almost all medical products. And the public is now demanding comprehensive information about those products. There has been an explosive growth of new technologies. One of the very interesting things going on in FDA is that in the late 1990s and early part of 2000 and on, the drug pipeline has been drying up. The number of new molecular entities approved by the Center for Drugs is shrinking. In contrast, the number of new technologies and breakthrough te technologies seen in the device world, including in vitro diagnostics, is increasing, not decreasing at all. There are an increasing number of U.S. manufacturers who, mostly for economic reasons but also for other reasons, are using foreign clinical trials. That adds a degree of complexity to what's going on. The marketplace has changed. We, the FDA, are now working with regulatory agencies from Asia, from Europe, from parts of the Middle East, not so much from South America or Africa, but some at both places. And there's an increasing volume and diversity of imports that FDA is being asked to regulate and control. A few definitions. The legal definition of an in vitro diagnostic are reagents, instruments, and systems intended for use in the diagnosis of disease or other conditions. 
including a determination of the state of health in order to cure, mitigate, treat, or prevent disease or its sequelae. Such products are intended for use in the collection, preparation, and examination of specimens. Brief de definitions, analyte-specific reagents, which are important in the way FDA regulates products, are the building blocks for the laboratory test we'll talk about today. I can't do a justice defining homebrew devices, but these are essentially tests developed by individual hospitals or laboratories intended to be used within those institutions. However, the legal definition of homebrew and what's actually happening in society is part of the talk later. And finally, Andy used the initials IVDMIA, in vitro diagnostic multivariate index assay, profiling tissue or blood, body parts with multiple variables and then using an algorithm that turns into what is an assay that gives diagnostic or prognostic information. Brief history of diagnostics as medical devices. So the world of medical devices was regulated from approximately 1938 to 1976 under the Food and Drug Cosmetic Act, and they were regulated as drugs. And in the 1970s, the Congress recognized that drugs and devices were different animals, and they needed to be regulated in different ways. And so the medical device amendments were separated out from the drug world in 1976. Many diagnostics at that time, so some of you are old enough, most of you are not, to remember a little over 30 years back that the world of drugs and diagnostics, well, in diagnostics, a lot of it was hospital-based technology or based in physicians' offices. So laboratory tests for otitis media, TB, et cetera. And the amount of resources given to the agency to regulate devices was small and even smaller for diagnostics. And at that time, in the 1970s, diagnostics were thought of as, on, in general, average or low risk compared to the life-sustaining and life-supporting devices that the agency was asked to regulate. So that, in fact, is going to give you the structure, the context for what followed. Brief crash course in something relevant to clinical laboratories. Most of you probably know this. Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendments Act of 1988 was enacted as a result of reports of an inaccurate test result from pap smear mills. Questions were raised about how laboratories function and quality control, and Congress discovered that at that time, only 12,000 out of 200,000 laboratories were regulated. So they slapped CLIA into the system. A law was passed in 88, took four years to promulgate the regulation. Something important to note here, a little digression for you to a little FDA 101. The Food and Drug Administration's regulatory agency do its, does its job under the rubric of laws determined by Congress. So FDA, in practice, is supposed to do what it's told to do by Congress, not what it wants to do or even what it should do. So it's a matter of what the laws are. Regulations are imposed by the agency to implement the laws. So a regulation has the force of law. So if a manufacturer or a hospital does something that does not comport with regulations, it'll be in violation, and the product could be pulled off the market or someone could be litigated against. Guidance documents, which you see many, many more of from the agency than you see regulations, are just supposed to be that, guidance. So you can violate guidance and not be taken to court or not be in violation of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. But regulations do have the force of law. And the regulation was promulgated by the Department of Health and Human Services, 92. Two other key notes is that the authority to categorize tests, which I'll talk about in a second, was delegated from the Center for Medicare and Medicaid to the agency just four years ago. And a year later, a draft guidance was issued because the categorization of these lab tests, assigning new commercially marketed lab tests to one of three CLIA categories, wave moderate or high, makes a big difference in how something is actually inspected by the CLIA inspectors and therefore what expectations there are of the laboratory test. Some structure for FDA. In roughly 2002, if I remember correctly, the Office of in Vitro Diagnostics, which was originally a division under the Office of Device Evaluation of involving all devices, was assembled together in one place to handle all aspects of in vitro diagnostic approval, 
post-market problems, and compliance. So approval is getting things on the market, post-market problems, adverse event reporting, compliance, manufacturing the device and marketing device in accordance with the approval granted by the agency. So this includes a number of vehicles designed to help bring products to the market, including not only the usual regulatory path, but a very heavy interactive focus. The Office of In Vitro Diagnostics works very heavily with sponsors or manufacturers to bring products to market. And I'll talk later about the de novo 510K pathway, which was established by the Congress in 97. There are three divisions in the Office of In Vitro Diagnostics, immunology and hematology. Here are examples of the kinds of tests that it regulates, allergy tests, autoimmune, et cetera. Division of chemistry and toxicology, lipids and cholesterol testing, general or specific chemistry tests, drugs of abuse testing would be handled there. And finally, the division of microbiology devices, which would include antimicrobial susceptibility, STDs, hepatitis, herpes. How do we regulate devices? So for a minute, I'm going to talk about the overall structure of what the Center for Devices and Radiological Health does, and then try and subdivide that to how that might apply to in vitro diagnostics. First of all, the basic approach is to base the degree of control on risk. So if I want to put a new heart valve on the product, on the market, what I'm expected to show the agency is different than if I want to put a new Band-Aid on the market. And yes, a Band-Aid is a medical device. So you want to make sure that you're not asking somebody to kill an ant with a hammer every time. Even though the industry will tell you that FDA is only about killing ants with hammers. But we're not. We actually try to base our degree of regulation control on the risk of the product basically to patients. Once in a long while, some of that risk is actually to the providers or users of the technology. We weigh benefit versus risk to determine what is in the law, and it's different than the drug law. The device law is different, and FDA's responsibility is to have a reasonable assurance of safety and effectiveness. And I'll talk about that a little bit later, as I will talk about what does the use of valid scientific evidence mean? And then in 1997, Congress imposed an additional burden on the agency and directed the agency. It's almost a finger-wagging kind of part of the law, which says, you, the agency, are to only require that manufacturers provide data that meets the least burdensome test. So the agency should not be asking for excess information that's not required to assure a reasonable judgment for safety and effectiveness. And this least burdensome is a way of Congress telling the agency, get the products out the door. And in a sense, almost, we don't really care that much about safety. And how do I know that? Because in the law, Congress rec requires the agency to inspect medical device manufacturers at least once every two years. The average across the medical device industry for which Congress appropriates money in order to fulfill the mission it's directed, the average is once every seven years. So Congress says, do this least burdensome, get the products on the market. Now, Congress says, you need to make sure they're safe. Go out and visit the manufacturers. And here's the money to do one-tenth of your job. So you can tell what the message is. Provide reasonable assurance. We're going to come to that in a bit. What are the classification of devices? The three big classifications are here. Class one, again, general controls. What's a general control? Basically, good manufacturing practice, or what the FDA calls quality system requirements. There's a section of the Code of Federal Regulation which tells you how to make a product, and how to make a product that's reliable and consistent, so that you as consumers, you guys are doing lab tests, so when Company X, when Abbott or Roche make a product, you want to make sure that what you're getting is consistent. And that's true for an in vitro diagnostic, as it is for a catheter or an infusion pump. And for things like latex gloves, most of these are exempt from pre-market submission. So the manufacturer has to understand what it's required to do and does it by self-certification. Class two, moderate risk products. We provide special controls. And here's what's called 510K. The sponsor notifies the FDA I plan to market this product in 90 days, and I'm telling the FDA that my product is substantially equivalent 
to a product already on the market. The product already on the market is assumed to be safe and effective. So if I'm marketing a product that's as safe and effective, then it's going to be safe and effective. And we have a feature that we're now actually starting to look at called predicate creep, meaning Andy markets a product and it's good. I now have to prove, so Noah wants to market the next product, and he has to prove that it's basically equivalent to Andy's. It'd be plus or minus a couple percent. It can be plus, better. It can be close, maybe a little minus. And then I market one, and then Don markets one, and Shearston markets one, and you no longer know how good the product is because there's no requirement to test the next predicate against a gold standard. You're always testing against something that was imperfect to begin with. So there's sort of a built-in possible run to a lowest common denominator when in fact, technically, we think that most products are improving, but we don't know exactly how much or by when or how. how. So there's a little flaw in the fundamental structure of this, but that's the way products were directed by Congress for FDA to put them on the market. It's a big controversy about 510K. Class three, highest risk products, pre-market approval. And I'll tell you what's in, required in that in a couple of seconds. It's a lot of testing and validation. In 1997, the Congress invented the de novo process. And I'll tell you why, but basically, these are device types that have never been marketed in the US, but whose safety profile and technology are now reasonably well understood. And we'll talk about that in a little more detail and tell you what we put in there and why. And then there is, an, in the drug world, it's called orphan device. We call them humanitarian device exemption, HDEs, devices for orphan, orphan status, or orphan diseases, intended to benefit patients. And in the case of diagnostics, you would only be allowed to test 4,000 patients. So it's not 4,000 patients who have the disease, because then you would have to be testing much more. So an HDE for in vitro diagnostics, only up to 4,000 tests. An HDE for a device would apply directly to the patients with disease. I've talked a lot about safety and effectiveness. What does that mean? Well, the key elements of this are valid scientific evidence and looking at clinical outcomes, which never used to happen, is increasingly happening in the vitro diagnostics as being part of our regulatory mandate. I will tell you for the first maybe 15, maybe 20 years after 1976, this was almost never a question at the FDA. On the other hand, we never regulate the practice of medicine. So a clinician choosing to use a product in a way he or she thinks is appropriate to serving the patient. Even if there's been no valid scientific evidence, FDA does not regulate it. Well-defined intended use we're going to talk about, and we're going to talk about labeling a little bit later. What does valid scientific evidence mean? In the regulation, that's the implementation of the law, it could include well-controlled investigations, randomized controlled trials, partially controlled studies, studies in objective trials without matched controls, including reports of significant human experience with a marketed device. So these are all valid scientific evidence. Depending on risk, you want to be higher up here. So high-risk devices, you really want to make sure you're in this range. Moderate-risk devices can be placed on the market with lesser evidence. What is a 510K? You have to say your device is substantially equivalent to an existing product. For all devices, not just IVDs, I don't have a figure for IVDs, only 10 to 15% require clinical data. Most of the devices are put on the, on the market with bench testing only. And that might sound peculiar, but you're talking about a wide range of products from mapping catheters, biopsy forceps, where engineering data should be sufficient to provide you and I the reasonable assurance that the products are safe and effective. And that's not untrue of IVDs as well. You don't need the full range of the studies I'm going to show you for pre-market approval in a minute to assure that the product you're trying to put on, which is another test for herpes where there's already 10 on the market, you don't need to go back and redo the whole song and dance. So there should be some performance testing, which is usually confirmatory with some examples, feasibility study, and the type of study dictated for a 510K by the ability of bench and animal testing to answer relevant questions about safety and effectiveness, and whether the new product, whether the subject device, the new one, is similar or different to the predicate. 
If it's functionally the same and looks the same, the features are not that different, it wouldn't raise a lot of questions. For products that potentially would be high risk, and that certainly in the last few years does include a raft of IVDs that may be used for screening for cancer or for the diagnosis of, of serious disease which might promote surgery right away, you want to make sure that you establish firmly by itself safety and effectiveness. The process is similar to a new drug application. Clinical studies will almost always be required from analytical to feasibility through phase two, a pivotal study. And then the reason I put question mark here is even after the establishment of, a, of the safety and effectiveness of a product, often, roughly half the time, the FDA will insist on some structured post-market follow-up to ensure that the product is actually working in the community the way it was intended. Oh, and by the way, it almost never does. <clears throat> Not going to mention HDEs other than to say I talked a little bit about these products which fill a very special need for special populations, and they very often rely heavily on bench and animal data. The real concern for FDA before we put an HD on the market is safety and probable benefit, but the standard here for an HD is much lower. I'm going to flip these two slides. I apologize. In order to put a significant risk product on the market through the pre-market approval process, you need to come to the FDA as well as your IRB and ask for an investigational device exemption, permission to do human testing. The IDE process allows investigational device to be used in a clinical study, which will also include clinical evaluation or certain modifications or new intended uses of already marketed devices. So if you want a new indication and a significant risk, you still have to ask for an IDE, even if it's a well-known product. And what the FDA invented in the 1990s is a process to get sponsors to come in early to talk about the science before they get too far down the road. It's called the pre-IDE process. Sometimes it can be just a meeting to talk about the science, and sometimes it can actually be a formal submission for FDA to review, but it's not required. The IDE is required. And before the FDA Modernization Act of 1997, I apologize, and now we're getting into the other pathway, de novo, this part of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act automatically classified devices that were not in commercial distribution prior to 76 into class three requiring pre-market approval. So a new technology developed in 1991 or 1993 that had never been seen before, but even if it was only to diagnose, we'll say, male pattern baldness, which isn't significant risk, would automatically be classified in class three, requiring pre-market approval, and Congress said to us, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? And we said, it's your law. So in 1997, they passed the Food and Drug Modernization Act, which, by the way, in case those of you ever get anywhere near the Congress, the word modernization always means less regulation, don't bother the business people. They need to make money. So that's so if you ever see something like the Security and Exchange uh, uh, Commission Modernization Act, it's going the wrong way, guys. <clears throat> it's very scary when Congress uses modernization. Those at the agency think, okay, what tools are you taking away from us? Now in this case, believe it or not, this law was a real mix of pressure from Congress, like least burdensome, and something called Four Corners of the Label, which I'll talk about just very briefly. But a clever and wise addition to the regulatory system called de novo. And it said, in the law, provide a new mechanism for classifying new devices for which there's no predicate, but it's not high risk. Moderate risk devices that need to be put on the market, that you don't need to ask for definitive pivotal trials, that engineering, bench, or some combination of lab and animal data can get you to market without needing human experience. There aren't very many of those, but in in vitro diagnostics, this program has used this more than anybody else. It's used an alternative to PMA for lower risk devices, and the appropriateness of using de novo is determined on a case-by-case -case basis, but it's always risk-based, risk to the patient. Meaning in your world, if the finding from the clinical lab test would cause a clinician to create 
a treatment decision of significant risks, surgery for example, then you would not want this in de novo. But if the decision were, say, going to take another diagnostic test, so for example, if you said this person has an elevated value and we now want to do a mammogram, we're not sending someone to surgery, it may not be considered a high-risk test because you're not telling a woman you have cancer. You're saying, this looks funny. Let's go do a mammogram, which would then begin a more definitive clinical process. And if that's the pathway, it would not be deemed as high risk. <clears throat> so candidates, as I've mentioned, low risk for which there's no predicate, ancillary to other well-accepted methods, and we told industry, please discuss this first before you begin the process because a number of companies sort of self-regulate and say, oh, we're de novo, and then you discover you're not, you make them go back to the drawing board. I mentioned homebrew. Well, what's that all about? <clears throat> FDA exercises discretion not to regulate what are called laboratory-developed tests or homebrew tests, and they decided to do this for two reasons. Number one, 1988, laboratories were regulated under the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendments Act, which was largely thought to be sufficient for most laboratory-developed tests. Why? Because most of those tests were not high risk. They were sufficiently controlled within the hospital environment, and trying to regulate hundreds of thousands of labs was not very practical. And this is the second big reason. We are guarding limited resources, and this is the metaphor for how FDA feels every day of the week. Okay? You feel like that when you're trying to write a grant, they feel like that when they're trying to clean their inbox. That's the way people feel. Get the products to market. And so trying to regulate laboratory-developed tests was impractical. But how do we put a product on the market? What are the elements of a submission? How do we determine that the product is safe and effective? And here I'm now going to be talking about in vitro diagnostics. So this is what the Office of In Vitro Diagnostics would expect in a submission. What are you using the product for? And I can't emphasize too strongly, I should have underlined and put this in bold, what the intended use of the product is part of the device. That is, the device is not just this laser, it's this laser for eye surgery, which may be very different than this <clears throat> laser to take a wart off. So the device if this laser would do both, would do eye surgery and would take warts off, could be classified, this identical product, in two different classes because the intended use is risky or not. So it's the device, product itself, physical, plus its intended use as described by the manufacturer and presumably used by the clinicians for that purpose, comma, almost never does, but the way it works, but that's the law and the regulation. So that's really the picture here. And so that's critical. Once you figure that out, then the sponsor with his presumably lab and academic colleagues demonstrates through analytical validation and then later often, but not always, clinical validation whether the test really performs the way it's supposed to. I mentioned manufacturing, design, controls, and quality systems. These systems are absolutely integral to the way in which FDA believes it's assuring safety and effectiveness of devices. And then down here, labeling, which we'll talk about briefly in a couple seconds. <clears throat> intended use. The claims made the intended use will determine the type of review and the types of study that are necessary. And I gave an example down here from the Roche AmpliChip. I showed you a little picture of that very earlier in the device classification slide. The Roche AmpliChip SIP 450 test is intended to identify a patient's CYP2D6 and 2C19 genotype from genomic DNA extracted from a whole blood sample. Information about these genotypes may be used as an aid to clinicians in determining therapeutic strategy and treatment dose for therapeutics that are metabolized by these genes. And so that tells you what the company expected the device to be used for. And then we and the company then determine what kind of data you need in order to substantiate that claim. That's the use. <clears throat> in vitro diagnostic products, like all devices, require evidence for safety, reasonable assurance, this term is used over and over, that the probable benefits outweigh the probable risks. That's what everybody's weighing. 
Now, it's hard to weigh this when you're looking at a predicate device. So you're trying to compare device X for testing for herpes for a device Y, whose characteristics are well known, or maybe not so well known. And if the predicate device on the market is not that well known, trying to actually do that is pretty tricky. And I will tell you that it's art more than science. And then, after safety, effectiveness. Based on valid scientific evidence, I showed you the list. Does it provide clinically significant results? Meaning, are you going to make a treatment decision? Are you going to tell the patient something informative about how he or she may act or how, what he may understand or she may understand about the disease? For the most part, the concentration of FDA and concern is first and foremost for safety. Products that don't work, we don't want to put on the market, but products that people put on the market that wind up being injurious to public health are the things that FDA folks wake up at night in cold sweats about. I mentioned analytical validation for lab tests. It's a long list of things that we're looking for data about. We're looking for precision, reproducibility. We're looking for accuracy, clinical samples, and where necessary compared to a cleared product or the gold standard. And this is where if you keep comparing to cleared products over and over and over and get away from gold standard, you may get creep away from knowing how well it really performs. These are topics that you should be familiar with, limits of detection, assay limitations, confidence intervals, carryover problems or cross-hybridization in terms of the way it's actually working in the lab. Here's a better definition, a little more extension on reproducibility, analytical validation. We want to make sure that studies evaluate the reproducible assay at external sites. So again, if you're trying to market a product, you want to make sure it works as well at the University of Washington as it does in Swedish or in the University of Kansas, not just one place. Real clinical samples are important. Sometimes that's hard to get for places where they say very rare alleles. So you may have to use contrived or enriched samples. <clears throat> Clinical validation is not often asked for, but when it is, we want to see new clinical trial data or retrospective studies. And certainly in in vitro diagnostics, retrospective studies have a significant place in our uh, putting products on the market. And review of information literature can be sufficient to put a product on the market. There's an enormous amount of information about P450, not about the product, but not needing to show the clinical connection between P450 and clinical outcomes. That had already been done. Don't make a company reinvent the wheel was unnecessary. I mentioned the importance of the quality system regulations, which requires manufacturers to define their inputs, outputs, and a controlled environment and process. And I will say that in the lab medicine area, this is highly variable. And I only point out that labeling is important because this is where FDA sort of kind of drops the ball. And it's part of FDA, it's part of the lab medicine community, it's part of the physician community, and everybody in a sense is pointing the finger at each other. So the company makes the product. It defines the intended use. That's what FDA rev reviews. FDA says this is on your label, expecting the lab medicine guy to read the label and the physician to read the label. Well, that doesn't always happen. And so when not everybody is reading the same information base or appreciating the same, information that goes to the patients, decision-making made by clinicians and patients can be highly variable. You guys know this from the way you live. I don't need to tell you this. And this is where I think the public is now saying, tell me more. We expect comprehensive information. We're not getting it. And the doctor's saying we're not getting it. And the manufacturer's saying, FDA, this is all you're asking for. FDA says, this is all the law is telling us to do. So we're in a situation where I think there's a lot of room for improvement, but nobody owns this. And I think it's something that we really should take very seriously. OK, now the two examples. Mr. Hyde, it's one of my favorite topics. Because in fact, when this started, I was working for 10 years at the National Cancer Institute. And in 1988, the FDA approved the PSA test. It was approved in 1988. What was it approved for? Anybody know? Monitoring for disease. The approval, the label, the claim made by the company that came to the FDA said, the way this product will be used is that if someone has prostate cancer, 
and they've been treated, we'll do blood tests to follow up if they need more treatment, if the disease is coming back. It was immediately used within weeks massively for screening elderly gentlemen like me for prostate cancer. And the incidence rates of prostate cancer, not only in this country but the rest of the world, but particularly in this country, shot through the roof. And it wasn't until 1990 that the National Cancer Institute began the prostate, lung, colorectal, and ovarian trial to actually establish whether this test, massively used for screening off-label, and for which we all paid a pretty insurance, pretty hefty insurance premium for a lot of testing and an enormous amount of surgery. And the results from that trial were published last month, 2009. The distance between the approval of the product and the use of the product and definitive understanding of whether it works or not, 21 years. Something's broken. And this is about to happen in cancer over and over again because products can be put on the market with a claim for monitoring and it's much easier to establish effectiveness in monitoring than screening, but nobody can stop people from screening. Why? Because it's the practice of medicine. And Congress has told the FDA and the Center for Medicare and Medicaid, you shall not regulate what doctors do. Now, there may be some doctors in the audience, and I'm not saying you all practice cowboy medicine, but these guys were. And if you looked at the literature, you looked at the two studies in the New England Journal, the European study pretty clearly demonstrates probably some benefit from PSA testing. The U.S. study, at its surface, was a failure. So if you just look at the surface results, it says PSA had no appreciable effect on prostate cancer mortality. So why bother? Well, here is where the FDA, the American Cancer Society, and clinicians around the country and professional studies dropped the ball. In 1988, when this began to be used massively for screening, it contaminated the hell out of the prostate, lung, colorectal, and ovarian trial started in 1990 because you couldn't find a control group that wasn't tested. 40%, if I remember correctly, and I could be wrong, I believe it was 40% of the men in the non-PSA group had PSA. So you're not talking about comparing apples to oranges, you're comparing apples to apples plus oranges plus potatoes. Second, Mr. Hyde, Overshore. How the heck did an IVD MIA get to market claiming to be homebrew? And so this is the recent story for Overshore. The company self-determined its regulatory status. The company and its lawyers, who maybe had a vested interest in saying we're homebrew, we don't need to send data to FDA, they said, hey, we're homebrew. We're a single lab determining results as in hospital-based tests. You'll just send us the results from Iowa, from the Netherlands, to the Netherlands, from Texas. And so therefore, we're like a single lab, even though we are purportedly telling people you may have ovarian cancer. FDA, in its letter back to the company, determined the, the company was offering a high-risk test that has not received adequate clinical validation. And after an enormous amount of legal fighting and intervention fairly high up in uh, HHS, the company finally buckled, but it took a long time. And there are a lot of people who are getting overshore testing without adequate clinical validation. And how does it happen? It happens because companies are allowed to say that their regulatory status is X or Y, but more important, the entire growth of the homebrew industry has left the FDA in a pickle because the precedents that have been set for regulatory review of lab, laboratory-based tests were constrained by resources and not by science. And because what was being done in 1976 largely was not testing to tell people you had cancer. The tests that were being done in 1976 were largely things that were moderate to low risk and didn't require a heavy regulatory hammer. People didn't imagine hospitals by themselves would be developing cancer-related tests or very significant heart-related tests for which surgery might happen right away. And people thought there'd be much more back and forth about science. And so the, the whole playing field has changed and FDA regulations haven't changed with it so swiftly. However, there's good news. 
I promise that these are the frowny faces. There's good news. The IVD MIAs, three of them have been cleared by the FDA, and you have to give credit to the scientists and the regulatory affairs people in these organizations that ponied up, brought data, and convinced the agency that these were legally marketed tests and would provide clinical benefit that had a reasonable assurance of a probable benefit outweighing a probable risk. So the multivariate index assays we've cleared include Mammaprint determines the likelihood of cancer recurrence, Alimap, and Pathworks. And so these, and this was this particular test for classifying tumors is, sorry for the initials, substantially equivalent, 510K, to immunohistochemistry. In all cases, analytic performance was characterized using samples and analysis that tracked the molecular signature of the product so that really you're talking about now a sophisticated mapping of the data and the test to a reasonable assurance of effectiveness of the product that it really works. And so there really has been a generational change over the last few years in IBDs, and we think people now working particularly in laboratory science and understanding what multivariate index assays are and can do really can bring high quality data to FDA and get a reasonable determination that you should go to market. Summary. Diagnostic testing is becoming more complex. It suggests early interaction with FDA is very desirable. A lot of times companies wait too long and then they've done the wrong studies. Making companies redo studies is inefficient. It's inefficient for two reasons. It wastes money. Uh, actually, three reasons. One of the really good reasons to come to FDA is if you've done studies and FDA makes you redo them, there's an ethics issue here. Making people involved in studies that wind up not being useful for regulatory clearance is a little bit unethical. Please be in my study and maybe FDA will take it. You want to check first. And third, most of this delays products to market. And if the products are useful, that's an opportunity cost, an economic term, for patients who could benefit. Recently, both the association that represents medical device agencies, uh, medical device companies called Advimed and Genentech, have asked FDA to develop a new triage system for how they regulate these more complex products. The response has not yet been generated by FDA, but I would stay tuned to the website and take a look to see how we're going to respond to these citizens' petitions about a new system for triaging in vitro diagnostics. The new de novo process really has helped bring new technologies whose safety and effectiveness have been established, and sometimes even been established in Europe, well-done tests elsewhere, brought to the market without having to redo them in the U.S. And finally, there are new questions of review in diagnostic devices. IVD MIAs has started to make FDA ask new questions that we wouldn't have asked 10 years ago. And the change in the technical landscape is an evolving process. And I encourage you to have an open dialogue with the laboratory scientists at FDA. Bring them here a couple times a year, have workshops, tell them what you know so they know what they're looking at. I think that kind of dialogue could be very fruitful, and I'd be happy to promote it in any way. I want to thank Andy again and the department for inviting me. I appreciate it. I hope it's been interesting and helpful. Thank you very much. We have time for questions. I'll repeat them for the camera if you have any questions. And if you don't, then we can have a, a short day. But questions? So let me, I'll, I'll start off. We have, um, we have a lot of assays where the control, the control materials for the assay isn't really matrix matched to human serum plasma, which causes problems as the assay starts to drift in its quality, we can't tell. Yet, there's no, I mean, how does the FDA decide what control material is appropriate for a manufactured uh, device, uh, an in vitro diagnostic? Okay. So the question is that there is not good matrix mapping, uh, matching to the, the controls, and you get control creep or, or fluctu fluctuation and variability, and how does FDA assure that this works? Now, I'll tell you the way we think it should happen, but I have a suspicion it's not happening that way, and I suspect that somebody's dropping some ball somewhere. If you look at the company's quality system regulation, what they put in in their control process that's supposed to be part of what they're controlling. So somewhere along the way, unless you're talking about buying you know, aftermarket products these, that, you know, that aren't from the company that are producing the assay, they really should have that under some level of control 
And if that's not happening, there should be a feedback system to the company from you guys post-market complaints that's supposed to tell them, you know, these things are varying and fluctuating, and they're supposed to be working on that. That's in the quality, quality system requirements. My guess is it's not happening, and I don't know why. But if they say something like, well, our controls are supposed to vary within 20%, and we say that's preposterous, but FDA seems to have approved that, how does FDA say 20% is okay? Ah, so if we're doing it right, how does FDA say some of these limits of variability are acceptable? It should be based on our understanding that within that range, the probable benefit of the product outweighs its risk. That could still, it could still be pretty crummy. And a good example of this that I'm familiar with are glucose test strips. If you look at the limits of variability for blood glucose test strips, which people use 10, 12 times a day, test their sugar, and then take actions based on that, the control limits are horrible. And you can't figure out how come people are doing that. Because by and large, that range, safety is somewhat insensitive to that. If you think that, this, that these limits are too broad, we expect, maybe badly, the laboratory community to be coming and telling the agency that that degree of control is not providing a measure of safety that you think is adequate. And you've got to give that feedback to us. We go back to the company, international standards community, develop new guidance documents, which you actually can do, to change that landscape. So if you are in the middle of a situation, part of your role, in fact, part of your legal role, by the way, as a hospital, you have to do a report. I mean, if you get something that's not a safe situation, there's a regulation no one probably told you about. You have a duty to report to the company um, uh, that there's a, malf there, there's a potential for serious injury. It's part of the job, and I don't think it happens in lab medicine. The post-market system in laboratory medicine is a round peg in a square hole. And I, I can't talk about that too much today to, you know, for time reason, but laboratory medicine safety needs to be changed. And there's some processes at the agency to work on it, but I think they're really in infancy. So I encourage those kind of questions to come to the agency. So, um, you know, obviously once something is FDA approved, I guess since you're not regulating the practice of medicine, people are allowed to use things, you know, off-label. I guess the question is, as medicine or technology come so far that it's really complex and sort of relying upon physicians to be able to make good decisions about using things off label has, are we beyond that now and, and it should, should this be re looked at right so the question is because FDA does not regulate the practice of medicine uh, and things are used off label are clinicians in a position to understand what that means, and has laboratory medicine become sufficiently complex that we should relook really at what are those limits? And the answer is yes to both, but let me, let me say a little more than just yes. Um, I think lab medicine has gotten complex, and I think that we are not doing a good enough job interacting with clinicians and giving them useful information for patient decision aids and for clinician decision aids. So I think we in the scientific community can do better. Um, and I think that's what the IVDMIA debate is about, whether, in fact, this black box is informative enough. And I think that's the logical basis with FDA is putting a much more heavy regulatory hammer in this arena. When information can be taken from a pattern of, say, sample testing from a human, and a clinician can look at finding A is up, B is down, and C is also up, and interpret that because of his or her clinical knowledge, we don't regulate that very heavily. And the reason we've regulated IVD MIAs heavily is because we think the clinician doesn't have the sophistication to understand how this algorithm is working. So we are taking that onus and saying, no, 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 no. We need to see the kind of data that will tell us that clinicians can use this in a fashion that is safe and effective because it's too complex. So we're taking on that burden. But in the off-label arena, we're sort of proscribed from doing that. I absolutely think that we as a community ought to be doing some research to find out where are we dropping the ball? What interventions can we design? And are they policy interventions? Are they legal interventions? Do we need better guidance? Do we need better communication tools? Do we need better standards from CLSI or other organizations? Because I actually think it's an enormous problem. Um, and if you care, we did a study in the late 1990s we published uh, in the, I think it was the Annals of Internal Medicine. On, it's not a lab study, but it is very typical of these kind of products. 
we looked at the use of transmyocardial revascularization, um, and this is poking holes in the heart to change blood flow to reduce and relieve angina. Within two years, between somewhere between 65 and 80 percent of use was off-label. It's poking holes in someone's heart off-label. Where's the evidence base for this? It's scary. This is absolute scary. Uh, and I think that it's something that I've written several times about. And the agency, uh, it, you know, back to the guy with the fire under his butt, um, they just don't have the bandwidth to take this on. Now, they did in one case, in the egregious case of the marketing of biliary stents for cardiovascular use, a 10-year pattern of abuse finally was halted by the FDA about three years ago but with warning letters and compliance actions. But that's like, it's like whistling in the wind. I mean, it's just too common. I, I think complexity is a real issue. I think we should be looking at it. I, I think it's a really important public policy issue. Thanks for raising it. We'll take two more questions back there and call it a day. On the right, yeah. Can you speak up a little bit? Yes, uh, excellent talk. Thank you. Excellent. He said excellent talk. So that's the first thing. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. uh, it, it just, uh, I mean, in, in essence, we have another regulatory system in the country, which is the reimbursement system, so that you can sort of regulate whether a procedure is done by whether or not it's reimbursed by, by government payers, private payers, or both. So, uh, you know, and there's sort of some attempts to kind of beef that up with having stronger teeth and sort of sort of uh, evidence for any any medical procedure. So how do you how do you see that that aspect sort of interacting with FDA regulation in the okay. coming years? It's a really terrific question about the link between FDA regulation and a new quasi or uh, an sort of established quasi regulatory system that is the reimbursers. What they do and don't pay for also helps determine what patients and physicians get to use and how they get to use it. So two responses to that. First of all, there's been an increasing pattern at the FDA level to have joint meetings with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid, which determine a lot of reimbursement patterns. So for example, if you go back a few years, the way in which drug-eluting stents were placed on the market was really a joint decision, not together, but data produced for both decisions where there was an integrated decision about reimbursement. But the truth is, that the medical product industry, drugs, devices, biologics, campaign very hard at Congress to not link reimbursement with approval, unlike they do in most other um, nationalized, health, most other health systems in the Western health systems, because they want control. And so there are legal impediments to you know, reimbursement structure working together with a regulatory structure. But the dialogue is happening more often. And I would, again, the same way that people ask questions about off-label use or about laboratory limits, to the degree that you think that they're not talking to each other, I think you don't, I think you underestimate the power we have at a place that's as prestigious as the University of Washington to get that dialogue going and try and figure out where, particularly in laboratory medicine, is that dialogue not happening, that we need to initiate that and take control of that. And whether it's HIV testing, if it's herpes testing, if it's in the new IVD MIA world, I think we have a lot of control to start to pushing that uh, envelope. There are political problems pushing at the other end. There are real structural problems. And back to reimbursement, just so I don't fail to mention this, and this is a whole lecture by itself, the vast majority, and I would believe even for IVDs much more so, of decision making for paying is at what's called the local contractor level. The Center for Medicare and Medicaid does maybe a couple of dozen national coverage decisions a year. And there are thousands of products it should be looking at every year and it doesn't have the bandwidth. So it's done at the state by state level, which is crazy, but it's the way it is. Now, I think it's a great question. It could be a topic for you know, some collaborative reference. Okay, it's a little bit after 4.30. I promise Andy I'd be done. Thanks again.